So on this call, we're just going to be discussing what's new in Dynamic Ship 2.5. Um, we're going to go over the base usage of Dynamic Ship, just in case you haven't seen it before. And then we're going to go more into specific aspects that are new for this version. Um, like Ryan said, uh, keep putting questions in the chat as you come across them, as I'm showing examples. Now for, for Insight Works, um, we're a global company. Our, our main office is in Edmonton here in Canada, and we have uh, worldwide distribution and support people and staff. For Dynamic Ship, um, the biggest piece is going to be that we are integrated with live APIs from the carriers. So everything you're getting is live. You don't have to enter rate tables. You don't have to um, manage your, your um, rates with that. You can just get it live as it's being, as new contacts, uh, contracts are negotiated. And you can extend it to change behaviors as needed for the customer. Anytime you need uh, support from us, you can always contact our support, go through our website, look at our knowledge base where we've got articles that uh, discuss some of the new features, some of the new existing features, and help you, you know, support the end user or just the end user find answers to their questions. And that's pretty much it. We're going to go ahead and start off with our demo. So this is just a base business central. Uh, the only thing I've really changed here is I've made myself a warehouse shipping manager so that I have all my dynamic ship interfaces, um, interface tasks and everything here. I'm going to go into the order packaging. Again, nothing new here. It's just going to show me the orders that I have available. I'll go into my package worksheet for this one. And it's a pretty standard just sales order. Uh, has a couple items on it. First thing I'll show is that if any time, you know, we have the scan here box, you enter all your commands, they can be barcoded, they can be in a scanned by just a handheld scanner. If I hit help, um, it will just give me a report that can tell me all the commands that are available. Uh, I'll just preview it in this case. So this report is just going to print out with barcodes and show me all the commands that are available. Most of these commands are specifically just replacing actions within the interface. And I don't know why this report is taking so long to render. So let's uh, zoom in there a little bit. So you can see they're just uh, alphabetically sorted. Already there's a new feature here for Dynamic Ship 2.5. Pretty much all the reports have some sort of abbreviation for them. So instead of having to necessarily have your users use the copy last package if they don't have some kind of handheld scanner, uh, they can use the abbreviated versions to get the same effect but type a lot less characters. Um, so I'm going to start off on that and show just the basic packing procedure. So first off, I'm just going to make a box. Um, once we've got a box, we have a couple different things we can do but we're gonna start just packing items. So typically you would be scanning your items um, versus me, I'm just gonna be typing them in. Uh, do this, type two of those, and type two of those. So now I have a box, it has a couple items in it, but we can see here in the fact box, we don't have any dimensions or anything like that set yet at this point. Um, let me zoom out a little bit, just to make that a little bit more visible. So I can go in here and edit them manually. Now that's a common kind of way to, uh, people might want to handle that if they've got, you know, a bunch of stuff going um, all at once. The other things that we can do here, of course, is if we want to create other packages, we can create other packages just off of templates here. Templates just have those kind of options predefined based on your configuration. And then I can start packing some items here, pack two of those. And then I can go into the process of saying, you know, that's all I want to pack from this order. 
and just create a partially packed um, order that I want to ship out. In this case, I'm going to already start using one of the new features, which is this copy last package. Copy last package lets us take the last box that we created, so in this case, this guy right here, and duplicate it. So it's going to duplicate it um, exactly with the same packaging as the other one. And then we'll just get the label. So at this point, it's just telling me that I haven't packed everything, which is fine for our scenario because we don't need to pack everything. Uh, it's going to go out, it's going to query all the carriers and try to get all the rates that the carriers say are valid. So we've got FedEx here, UPS here. Those are the only two I've got configured in this system. Um, I'll just pick one of these FedEx rates, hit OK. It's going to go out, get the uh, get the label and bring it back for us. Now, how long this takes really depends on the carriers. Um, we're in a test system, so usually the APIs are a little bit slower within the test system. And now I've got my labels um, for all the boxes that I created. So three boxes, three labels. There's nothing special on them. And go out and say, you know what? Actually, this was wrong. I shouldn't have shipped it with FedEx. I should have shipped it with UPS. And I can go over here into our fast uh, fast tabs here and say, you know what? I actually wanted to ship this to UPS and let's change that. Now. This again is going to show something specifically new for dynamic ship. I could again use the get, get label command. I can also go for the interface. So depending on how comfortable your users are, they can use either or. And you'll notice this time, instead of going to the rates, it's just offering to print the label again. And this is specifically because of a new setup app option that we've introduced. Um, We've had the situation where some customers will get into a problem where their um, end users their, or their packers just kept relabeling and, and doing things like that and creating more and more labels. So we've added a new setup option to the dynamic ship setup uh, that determines whether or not a user can relabel a shipment. So if mistakes were made, you can start an approval process instead of having them just fix it themselves. So that's just this relabel allowed. Uh, right now it's set to no. We can alter that and set it to yes, and then everyone can relabel. So if it's a common issue where you know this just has to happen, you don't want any slowdowns, you can set that up, or you can set it up to admin only, um, which plays to the dynamic ship user set, which essentially says if you're allowed to edit the setup page, then you're an admin. Uh, and dynamic ship ships with two user sets that kind of reflect that. Uh, I'll set it to yes for now because I'm just going to be using the same orders kind of over and over. And then I can go back in here, get the label again for UPS, and it'll go out and shop the UPS rates. Now you'll notice I'm not getting any FedEx rates back this time, and that's specifically because I set the order to be UPS only order. I don't bother getting a label for this. Now, I'll unpack everything on this order, kind of start it from fresh. Um, go back here. I'm going to go back to the setup. And um, I'll show up another new feature here. So the, the next new feature is that we also have a setting now that will allow people to calculate the package weight as they're packing. So if your you know, business central system is very accurate and all your items have weights, be it in the unit of measure or the item card itself, and you want to use those for shipping, you can. Um, so we have this option here, calculate package weight. I can set that to use any of the specific kind of default nav fields, uh, default business central fields, and uh, go from there. Now, if you know, the user has some kind of custom configuration, their data is coming in externally, somehow our extensibility would make you great, can be used to kind of extend that and set this data point as well. I'm just gonna set it to unit of measure table. And because the item unit of measure has a weight field, but the weight field itself doesn't tell us what that unit is, we have another field that tells us what that unit is. So I've just kind of this configured to pounds right now. 
you could configure it to you know whatever unit of measure they want to use or whatever unit of measure they're recording that stuff in the idea would just have to be that it has to be consistent so that uh, the process works so once i've got that set up um, i'm just going to pin this guy here once i've got that set up and i'll make a new box so we have it fresh so right now there's no weight there's no dimensions no nothing um, i start packing items it starts accumulating that weight right um, and it's always going to pack depending on how much you're actually packing or wanting to pack or if i remove everything it's back to zero if i follow the same kind of process and i just use another license plate template that doesn't have a weight set and let's just do this guy and we'll do one of those and one of those and i'm doing this specifically to show another feature set um, with the copy last package so now we have this box it's you know 14.13 pounds has the same dimensions and i can use that copy last package again um, but what i can do this time is tell it how often I want it to duplicate the package. So by default, it's only going to make one copy, but I can tell it, you know what, I have enough for two, two more boxes at least. Let's do that. And it'll go ahead and do that. It'll recreate the box two times. Um, the other thing is if you have a process where, you know, you have a hundred of an item, you know it's going to go into 10 boxes. You make that first box and you do copy last package with a zero, it will try and duplicate the box as often as it can. There might be a remainder so in this case you know that exact box worked um, four times and then four of these were left because that was just too many for that and we can kind of keep that process going right now that's really good it, it can really speed up the packaging process for people who ship a lot of the same item to the same end user kind of thing um, because you can just kind of keep duplicating those packages um, another thing that we've added here in um, in 2.5 specifically is placeholders in the, the print custom piece. So the print custom, if you're not familiar with it, it just lets you add additional data to your label. People will usually want to add their external document number or potentially, you know, their sales order number, a different customer at reference point, item numbers, quantities all sorts of kind of information. So we have a bunch of placeholders that fit into that um, and we can just insert them as needed. So we can do bracket LP bracket and that's just gonna insert um, the license plate number. We can do bracket source to, to enter the source number. Um, and we have a knowledge base article that kind of explains what the different placeholders are that can already fit. Um, you can put multiple placeholders in the oops, in the same one, and our process is just going to replace those when we're hitting get label. So you can leave those in here, go back to my order, hit get label, hit yes on the unpacked lines warning. Um, let's just pick this guy. Hit preview. And if I uh, put in all those placeholders correctly, we'll see them here at the bottom of the label. So now we can see it's printed the license plate number. It's printed the first item that's in the box. This one is just, um, I think that's the sales order number that I put there. And that can keep going that way. Now, you might hit situations where, you know, your customer always wants the same piece of information on there. You, you know, you always want to do that. There's two ways you can kind of get that configured. So I'll leave this order here. Um, two ways you can get that configured. So one way is the customer options. I'm not going to talk about that too much because that's an existing feature. So you can go into the customer options, create a, an entry number for a specific customer, and that specific customer can then have a, a package option template where you could add whatever placeholders you wanted in the print custom to kind of make that happen. Uh, I'm going to delete this line because I don't want it anything else but if it's 
the same information that's going on the label every single time. Um, we do have a setup option that lets you now define a default package options template, a default shipment option template that you, to apply every single time. So if we look at that, we've got these default templates over here. We can set this to the example. We can set this guy to the example. And what that means is if there's no specific customer options, it will apply this default. Um, so you can still have your exceptions where certain customers need different information. And if they don't, you just want your general rules to apply. You can set that up here. This is great for setting, you know, default inco terms, um, default residential status, default blind shipping options, or um, anything like that that you you might need to use in your process, right? So I'll leave those configured for now, um, and we'll get to kind of like the the next options here. So if I open this guy here in the package options. This is specifically concerning assembly orders. So this order has an assembly item on it uh, that's assembled to order. And the default process up to this point was always to pack the components. So in this case, this assembly item is made up of this table and six chairs. Um, but you might have a process where because of how the picking works or, or the warehouse works, uh, you don't ever want to pack the components. You always want to pack the actual item. And that's also possible. So we can go back to the ship setup and go back into the general here, and we have this assembly out order behavior. So by default, it's just showing the components. We can change that to item, and once we've got that to change to item and open our package worksheet, now we only see the item. Um, this kind of has the effect that you're going to only be packing the item into your um, license plate if you're shipping this internationally. That's what's going to show up on the customs information. So you don't have to worry too much. When you're packing this stuff, we're still setting quantities on the actual assemble to order item as needed. So you don't have to worry about um, having to manually set those options there. Go back. Um, and another piece is this, this unpack lines warning. We do also now have an option to disable that. So if you end up in a process where you get that a lot because you're just you're handling a ton of partial shipments or what have you you can turn off that warning as well so right down here we've got warn on unpacked lines um, right now it's doing it always you can do it only on the get label process so if they're getting labels it can stop them and we're just going to set it to never for the rest of this demonstration and continue on so the next uh, new piece is essentially up to this point we've been very very tightly integrated with um, easy post um, but a lot of times people might have their own truck carriers some kind of pickup option uh, be integrated with an LTL that might not have an API or anything like that and while we're able to always extend to other APIs um, sometimes the customer might not want to spend the time on it or you know it's it's not worth it because the integration takes time and they have um, they don't want to spend the actual time investment on getting that going or you know their own trucking system obviously they might not have an API for anything internal so we can set up another freight integration provider um, that we've configured which is just called the external rate entry so we're going to set this guy to yes to enable it um, and we do have a knowledge base article on how to get this configured um, but essentially We've got this API key in here, and if we look at the carriers that are related to this, essentially we just have to have one carrier that has the same key in their account ID as the API key, and then we've got that lined up. And then that carrier just needs to have a service. All right, so while we wait on that, um, I'll just talk about that external rate entry a little bit. Um, so that external rate entry it essentially populates another rate um, into the sorry about that, but, uh, into the rate worksheet. So you can filter it down to that. You can have multiple carriers assigned to the external rate. Um, that's all fine. You just want one main one that kind of covers that. So if we go into this order right here, um, We'll clear the UPS so that we can actually see the external rate entry on that as well. 
hit the get label again. Now this is gonna query everything. So that's gonna say, hey FedEx, what are your rates? Hey UPS, or what are your rates? And I can, uh, oh, did I have this? I think I hit escape instead of confirm. Um, but it's going to query all of them to try and get as much information as it can from, from all the APIs that are configured, right? So if you had multiple, it's perfectly fine. If you potentially have, you know, multiple easy bit post accounts that you need to use for some reason, you have custom integrations you want to create, that's all possible. Um, so right now we're getting all the FedEx guys and we're also getting USPS. So if we scroll down here a little bit just to see the carrier messages. I have USPS configured as the external carrier, and it'll just say, you know, selecting this rate opens a new page where you can configure everything. Um, I have it configured right now to default to $125. That can be changed to whatever value, um, you know, the end user needs there. You hit OK, and it opens this new page to kind of let me define everything that I need to. So, you know, say you have your internal trucking process, um, you might have this order preset to that and then you can have that filled out. It does allow selecting every carrier that's configured within dynamic ship carriers so that if there's some kind of cross use or something, you know, say you're using um, FedEx ground parcel and FedEx freight and you only want to use the FedEx entry, you can do all that. Um, pick one, pick a service. The user can then enter whatever cost would be associated with it. Um, whatever delivery days and you know whatever whatever tracking number may be. Now all this stuff flows back to the order the same way the normal base business uh, base dynamic ship process works in business central. So the package tracking number comes back there, the delivery days come back, the cost can get added to the order or not added depending on configuration pieces. And all that stuff works the same, just with a free form entry specifically for people who you know, maybe still have um, a stack of labels from LPLs where they're manually kind of filling out this information and just want to enter their tracking number. That is also pretty customizable. So if you do have a customer that then needs to, say, add a tack number or anything like that when they're sealing up the truck or seal number, essentially we would just provide the page, you duplicate it, you modify it, um, and then you just update the code unit number and you're good to go to let them enter whatever custom information they need on top of that. Um, the next bit I'm going to kind of show is just the uh, international orders specifically. So for the international orders, um, it's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to do this, and then I'm going to show a new feature which lets us combine commands. So in this case here, I'm making a new box and packing everything into it. Uh, you can combine a whole slew of commands. There are some limitations imposed by Business Central. So if if you do a new box and then try to edit the um, dimensions right away and use both of those commands, so say hyphen hyphen new and hyphen hyphen package details, that won't actually work because the record isn't committed yet to the database, so you have to separate those commands. But the majority of commands can be changed, uh, chained. Hit this and oh, I had the auto calc weight on, but uh, I just overwrote that. Now I'll get labels again. You know, my, my external service is still here, so it's not limited in any which way, it can be if needed. Um, and I'll just pick one of these UPS services, um, and now. You kind of saw it flash for a second, but then the business central transition happened. Basically, I get an error message and it tells me, you know, customs information is required. So that isn't new in itself. That's always been the case. If you're shipping internationally, you need customs information. What is new here is instead of having the user manually need to create the customs information, if you know that you have good setup data, you know, you've got your tariff numbers entered, you've got your weights entered, um, you've got your pricing set up and all that stuff. I can come in here and say, you know, create customs information automatically, and I can say yes. I can also force it to create customs information for every order if I want to. Um, this, this is good if you have any kind of border crossing services that you use where you're shipping to an endpoint that's uh, domestic, and then they take it across the border. 
I also have an option to set the default content description. So if you work with a lot of just kind of one product, say radios or something, and you're always shipping some kind of radios or radio parts, you might benefit from just having one default content explanation, fill that in, and then that'll get applied to the customs every time as well. So now we're gonna go out of this guy, go back to our order, um, and now I can hit get label. And this time when I hit get label, it's going to create that customs information for me so that I don't need to go in there and manually um, have the user certify anything or do anything like that. Oh. Oh, um, this is a mistake from me because um, I overwrote this weight and the weight of the items exceeds that. So um, FedEx is telling me, you know, your package can't be lighter than what you're telling us the items are, which is valid. So I hit get label again and take FedEx again. So now it's going out and uh, getting the label here. The label isn't very interesting, so I'm going to close that guy. Um, if we look at the customs now, these were already pre-generated. So my setup value for the content description is here. My lines were added. Um, this company specifically has all this information configured. Um, obviously, if your items don't necessarily have that configured, then I wouldn't recommend generating that automatically because you might get errors back where um, you know you, you end up having missing data on on that international stuff. So I can also post post the same way as you always did. Um, we do have an additional setting regarding the posting as well now, which real quick which basically just lets you prevent posting without a label. Um, so you might run into the issue where someone just forgot to do the get label and posted the order, and now you have to either unpost your order, create a miscellaneous shipment to label, or something along those lines. Um, this can kind of stop that process. And the external rate entry, even though we're not generating a label, it does adhere to this too, and it counts as labeling the shipment. All right. Um, the next piece is really more related to um, some improvements. So we now have some improvements around uh, the serial number and lot number handling and how that can play with copy last package. So in this case, for the serial number handling, and this um, setup option isn't technically new, but I'll show that. Um, we have essentially the item tracking behavior, which is skip, re-enter, or confirm. Confirm means your serial number or lot number has to line up with something that's already on the order. Re-enter just allows them to override it and skip will just skip it. So anytime you want a second validation of lot numbers or serial numbers, confirm is what you'd want to use. Any other time where you know you might preset that on the order, but then the picker actually picks something else off the shelf, uh, you, you'd want to use re-enter. Skip is probably the most common process because if you're using some kind of pick, um, you're setting the lot numbers, setting up the serial numbers, and you kind of want to just handle that there. So if I make copy that guy, if I make another box and I package one of these, oh, package one of these up, um, it's just going to pick a serial number out of this list and put it into a box. Now. What I can do here is still do a copy last package. And what it'll do is it'll generate three boxes. It won't reuse that serial number. It'll use the serial numbers that's already on the line. Um, so if you have that stuff pre-configured, you can still pre -use, reuse the copy last package. And it's pretty much the same thing for if you're doing it with the lots. So I can put this, I can put two in here and say copy last package and just make as many copies as I can. Um, and it'll just respect those lots. Now it's left some lots alone because it couldn't put two of the lot into the box. 
but it's it's respecting the lot numbers that are set. Um, so it's not going to start copying lot numbers or serial numbers. Um, it's going to respect all of that stuff specifically. And uh, we can obviously post any of these orders, but it can help out. Um, the other the other piece I was going to show is that we have made um, some real improvements, kind of like to the email templates. So that's been a feature in Dynamic Ship for a while, where you can e send out emails to a customer upon making a label, upon posting the order, whichever process kind of works best for for you and your system. So what we're going to do is go straight into the email templates. Um, and that can be a default email template for everyone. You can have customer specific templates, just the same as before. Uh, we'll open up this template here. And what I've done here is I have a pretty basic email body. I have put uh, two different attachments here and I've kind of defined a couple of the, the other options. So first things you can see here is we have use user details. So if we hit no, it's going to use the sender name and sender email that are defined in the template. If we change it to email only or name only or email and name, it's going to look at the user. So in this case, my user in Business Central and see if I have my contact email defined or my full name defined and pull those details in. So that's really good for systems where you're using sales reps and you want emails to seem personalized and coming from your sales rep. Um, if you want them to come more from like a do not reply or order information email, then the no is your best bet and you want to just define them here as needed, right? Um, now for the reports that we can attach or use for the body, um, because on a warehouse shipment document, we support sales document and service documents, uh, we have a couple different options here, which is basically just between those two, and then what part of those you want to use. Do you want to use the sales order, the, uh, the sales shipment in, um, document, or the sales invoice document? And you can define however many reports you want as attachments. For the body itself, you can only ever use one report. So that's just this guy here. Um, so if you already have reports that you're using or, or customer specific reports, you can also add you know, specific layout codes. I don't know if either of these reports has one, no. Um, and use that to kind of like extend your email. So you can automatically attach the invoice or attach the sales shipment or use the sales shipment as your body. Um, obviously it's kind of twofold. If you do the body, you have the usage of same as before, um, using our parameters to fill in specific fields and kind of generate that email. If you use your report body um, and you kind of create an HTML layout, you can kind of you can achieve the same kind of effect with that. Um, the email subject still supports the placeholders. The email body still supports the placeholders. The email body is still entirely HTML in that regard. Uh, the other two options we've added here is to test the configuration, which specifically tries to determine if those reports are for the correct document types. So if you had a report that, say, had an integer as the main um, uh, item because it allows you to configure how many reports to print or something like that, that will fail the configuration. Now, that can give you false positive if the configuration or the data items on the report aren't named accurately. Um, so don't necessarily rely on that. But if that tells you there's an issue, you definitely want to try and send a test email. And the test email process is pretty straightforward. Um, it just takes this, it tries to find an order within the system that's usable and send a test email. So if this is installed on a brand new client system, they won't be able to send a test email until they've processed some orders within Dynamic Ship, where they've packaged things up, labeled it, posted it, and done all those kind of aspects, right? So if I send a test email, it's going to just ask me what kind of document I want to use, sales document or service document. So that's really useful for testing when you're using different kinds of reports. I'm going to go into other email, and I'm going to send it to this guy. Click OK. And what this does is 
It tries to use all the reports, it tries to collect any error information and kind of send that back to us. So typically if I didn't have data, it would tell me there was no data. Um, this one here is just telling me it couldn't find, uh, couldn't set the rec ref for the report, which means basically just one of these attachments is failing. Probably I don't have a good sales invoice to use. I'm just going to delete that right now. Do that again. Now those kind of reports, when you're in your normal system, doing labels, um, posting orders and things like that, those reports are um, sent to the activity log so that the end user doesn't get interrupted. So it doesn't cause your posting to fail. It doesn't cause your labeling to fail. Um, they're just sent to the activity log. So you may end up with orders that didn't have an email sent um, specifically because that report failed in some fashion or something else failed in some fashion. Uh, apparently this report is also failing. Um, so the idea is that, right, you use this and obviously now I'm editing this kind of like on the fly and maybe even if my SMP, no, my SMP works. So now it's starting to send that email out. Um, it's the exact same process as when you're labeling or doing it on post, but it's doing it in a way that during the testing, you can see the errors instead of trying to find them afterwards and trying to interpret them. One thing I'll mention, this isn't new, um, but for that to work, you do have to have your SMTP mail set up working. So if this test email button doesn't work, then the dynamic ship process won't work either. Um, that's just information. It doesn't really um, change anything of that process. Now I'll give this a second just to see if we've already got this. So now we have this order. Um, it's got a link to the tracking. If we look at the tracking, this is just the easy post configure tracking for us. Um, that's all there. And it did send a previous email too with the attachment, uh, which was just the sales invoice. So as you can see, even during testing, you can sometimes get some um, false positives, which is why it's important to kind of run through the testing with that. Now, another piece, um, which if you're already using dynamic ship, probably familiar with the process that you know you've mislabeled shipments or you use the wrong service and you just want to refund that label cancel that label so previously uh, we did kind of force people to go into the easy post side of things because our um, process just didn't have a way to communicate that to them but now we do so if we go to our license plate list and we just look for any of the ones we kind of just recently labeled which I think I labeled this one. Actually, let me just use one of these. Um, any of those that we kind of labeled, uh, we have a couple new options for that kind of stuff. So they are on the license plate list as well, but if I look at the license plate itself, they're there too. So this one I know has a label. I can open it up. I've got quick shortcuts to go to the package worksheet, get the return label. This one's already shipped, so I can't open it in the package worksheet anymore, uh, but other license plates that still exist, you can. If I go into my actions, um, I have the option here for refund label. So refund label gives you two choices, which is either refund just that license plate. So if you have an order with three boxes, but only one of them needs the license, uh, the the label revoked. You know, maybe it's not the right weight, maybe it's the wrong dimension, something like that. You can revoke just that one, but you can also revoke the entire order, um, and then it'll revoke the, the label for each license plate. Regardless of what I'm gonna do here in the test system, um, the test system orders get processed really quickly and it's just gonna tell me, hey, this parcel's already shipped so I can't refund it. Obviously within a production system, you can refund labels until the carrier scans it for the first time. And at that point it's kind of um, blocked, right? So it makes it a bit easier because the end user essentially doesn't need to be going into the um, Easy Post website anymore, finding the order and doing all that stuff to kind of refund it from there. Now you can just refund it straight from the license plates. Plus it gives you a little bit um, more information to get specific dynamic ship related information. 
that we weren't that wasn't easily accessible before. So now I can really quickly see, you know, which orders were which packages were actually on this order, what's the tracking details for easy pulls for the carrier, uh, what was the cost and all that kind of stuff. And we can get all that really quickly from our license plate just for historical actions, right? Now I know I'm almost out of time here, so I'm just gonna go over two other pieces here real quick. Um, one of them is the freight price rules. We've extended those a little bit. So if you're not familiar with dynamic ship, this allows you to manipulate the cost that's coming back from the carrier, mark it up, reduce it, add rates, um, do whatever you like, customer specific, carrier specific, just in general. So the things that we've changed is we've added some additional freight charge rules. So there's the markup amount, which could be just, you know, add a flat $10 to every shipping label um, and add the combined markup, which combines the markup percentage and the amount. So it adds whatever amount you want and then adds a specific percentage. And that then can go back to the order so that the unit price on there is say $20 and the unit cost, which is what came from the carrier would be, you know, $15. Um, that's it. Aside from that, there are some other bits like uh, if you if you ship a lot with USPS or Canada Post, um, you can create their pickup labels or manifest labels from within Dynamic Ship using just the uh, manifesting function, and you can also set up predefined packages. So if you use the bubble wrappers or bubble envelopes from FedEx, you can define all that stuff within the carriers as well to make use of and tie that to a specific template to use. Uh, that's it for me. So if Brian wants to take over or field me some of the questions. Sure, sure. thanks Matt. Someone is asking about if 100 weight rates are supported. No, so 100 weight weights um, specifically is for LTLs. So I say no, but technically yes, um, because you can, um, or well, it's it's an LTL functionality specifically with I think FedEx maybe UPS. Um, it, the support can be built in, but it's not out of the box at this point. Um, we're building up support for the LTL carriers, but not in this release. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is uh, someone's asking if packing slips can be customized. Yes. So um, I'm going to be very clear here because. A lot of times people use their sales shipment as their packing slip, and that's perfectly fine. We do have a default packing slip that kind of comes with, um, and you can get the source to customize it or just use the built-in business central ability to kind of customize it. And that can be set on a customer to customer basis. So if you have different customers that like say one of them needs a four by six label, the other one just needs a paper slip in the box, that's totally possible you can use our report as a base and it's just based on the, the license plate header for that. Or, you know, if you are using your sales shipment document as your packing slip and you have custom report layouts with that, um, that stuff will still trigger just the same. Okay, Th thanks Matt. Another question here is, um, is there a way at the order level to mark it as free freight so that so that the freight setup, so that the freight setup is skipped, or would that be a customization that would need to be added? Um, so it, it, I guess it depends. So if you're just giving your customer free freight um, on a per order basis, no. If you're giving them free freight specifically because you're using their third-party billing account, then yes, we do have a setup option for that. Um, but if it's something that you're doing on an order to order basis, that's not in the product at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, those were all of the questions that we had at this time. Sorry, I'm hesitating here a little bit. We just, we got a lot of questions yeah. um, and, uh, and they've been mostly answered here. I'm just scrolling through them, it's looking good. Um, so with that, then uh, let me make a couple of uh, announcements. Again, for those of you that may have popped on late, we are recording this presentation. Uh, I will make it available to everybody. I'll send an email out tomorrow with a link to the presentation. You can share that around. Um, 
uh, at that time too, if you do think of questions or you 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 didn't ask a question uh, later on, you, you come up with something, you're welcome to reply to that email uh, and we'll certainly get that answered for you. Uh, but I think at this time, uh, I think we can close things off. Matt, you, you're you good? You ha don't have anything else to, to show? Nothing else to show. Most of okay. the other stuff is uh, just usability improvements that don't have a direct functionality impact. Perfect. Okay, um, so you can get more information obviously on our website. Uh, you can go to shippingfordynamics.com and that takes you right to the page on our website. Um, so you can look at the information there. You can also jump over to Microsoft App Source and simply search for Dynamic Ship and um, you can see that it's available in App Source. You can download it and try it out. Um, we've also got our knowledge base uh, at kb.dmsiworks.com if you want to dig into some of the more uh, details of configuration and setup and that sort of thing. So at this time, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for your attention and uh, spending the, an hour with us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, hopefully you have found this uh, of value and we you know, do host sessions on a regular basis. So I hope to see you again online at some point. <music> Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great content.